Uh, what this really is about is that we have done a library, Java Erlang, which is open source, available on GitHub, that uh, tries to make it a little bit easier to combine your Java code and your Erlang code. So, if you will, a marriage between Java and Erlang code. And it should be a happy marriage. So what goes into a happy marriage? Well, there has to be a dominant partner. Somebody has to be the boss. Somebody has to tell the other party what to do, right? Or maybe not, but anyway, let's pretend it's like that. So here, being an Erlang conference, of course, Erlang is a dominant part. Erlang is going to tell Java what to do, which uh, methods to call, which objects to create. And uh, so there's quite a lot of support for that in the library, whereas there is not so much support to do things from the Java side, uh, and perhaps this is one of the limitations of the library. So if you have any ideas about, uh, about how to do that after hearing this talk, please, please approach me, because it would be nice to add a little bit more facilities for, for uh, calling Java Erlang code from Java. But, uh, so, but nowadays, so far, this is all about calling Java from Erlang. Okay? So please also feel free to interrupt me whenever you want, if you have some doubts or something like that. Okay? So, listening to some talks yesterday, it became clear to me that it's a good idea to present what are the goals, what, what do you really want to do? Well, maybe we don't have so much goals here, but we have a... Well, maybe the goal is that we have some problems and we want to solve those problems, okay? So, it's a problem-solving task, this one. So, what is the problem we are solving? Well, we're at, I am part of a group of teachers that teach at the University of Madrid, and uh, one of the courses we teach on is, for instance, a course on algorithms and data structures, and people use Java all the time. Students use Java just to do that. And so, for instance, uh, uh, this year I think we have around 10, uh, around 10 uh, obligatory exercises, and uh, we have around 125 solutions that are going to be handed in for each of these exercises. Around 1,000 maybe exercises to correct in Java. That gets boring pretty quickly, okay? So that's a problem. We want, don't want to do this boring stuff. We also do other things. So we are involved in research projects that try to apply testing to a lot of uh, code. And sometimes, maybe the Java code is... Uh, maybe the code that we test is not Java itself, but uh, actually Java has some pretty good libraries for, for uh, doing part of the testing. So, for instance, we are working with uh, testing web services and... Uh, we are doing that by specifying the behavior of web services using a language called JSON schemas. And there is actually pretty good support from, from some libraries, Java libraries, to do that. So we would like to be able to call those to Java libraries. Another thing that is useful, GUI testing, we do that a little bit that as well, and you have Selenium written in Java. Maybe there are other APIs nowadays, but one possibility is called Selenium directly from Java. So actually Java has some good stuff. We want to use it. But we really don't want to write Java code. We like Erlang much better, okay? So, this is our problem. We have to call Java, but we don't want to do that, okay? So, thinking about them, you can get an idea what our library is about, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses, and clearly one of the strengths is going to be that it's going to be pretty easy to write, to call Java from Erlang. We don't want to have a lot of hassle doing that, so we want to streamline that process. But on the other hand, we are doing testing. So maybe we're not as much concerned with having really, the, really the best Java, uh, the best performance of doing calls from Erlang to Java. So maybe this is not going to be the library that you want to use if you're really, really concerned about performance, about having a call from Erlang uh, to Java in a very short amount of time. And there are, there are a lot of applications that need this. And so far, I think this library is probably not there yet. Okay? So. There is already stuff in Erlang for talking to Java. Perhaps the most, or certainly the most well-known library is JInterface, which is uh, basically what it does. Basically, it provides a uh, node concept. It, the Erlang node concept, it exports this to the Java world. So you can create, you can program a Java node, and that Java node can talk to the Erlang node. So distribution uh, between Erlang and Java. And this basically enables message passing. So from the Erlang side, things are pretty easy. So an Erlang process can send normal messages, doesn't have to care at all about that it's really talking to Java, to the Java side. So normal message passing from Erlang. Whether, but on the Java side, you have to work a little bit more because what you get, uh, 
are incoming messages, but these are not the incoming messages that would you expect to have normal uh, Java types like integers, longs, uh, strings, and things like that. But no, what you get in are objects that represent the, uh, an encoding of the Erlang values. So you have to unmarshal those, those values when you start working with them on Java. And there isn't a further complication. You really, so on the Java side, you don't really have processes and things like that. So you, d you have to decide what, uh, you have to write a protocol for everything you do. You have to write the protocols, you have to decide what is the vocabulary, how do the Erlang world speak, what messages does the Java side accept from the Erlang side, and things like that. So mm, a little bit work. But anyway, this works. People have used it to great effect, and uh, it's stable. Think we probably want to use it. But there are other options as well. Sorry. Uh, OK. Uh, strange. We probably lost the slide. No? OK, that's the slide. So there are some problems as well here. OK, so one that I was addressing was that on the Java side, for every program you want to, uh, Java program that you want to talk to from, from Erlang, whatever you want to do, er, er, the new task, you have to write quite a lot of Java code. So this is a typical skeleton here. You can see that, well, there is something called receive. So you get in the message, and then you start taking this message apart. And you see, oh, maybe the Erlang side wanted to call a method called M, and maybe we have a, this, this information is represented in a string. Well, then eventually, let's call the method I, M with the parameter I here. So for everything you need to do, you have to write this kind of uh, amount of Java code. And this is something we really don't want to do, right? Um, another thing, sad thing, in my opinion, perhaps, is that, well, if Java is about anything, it's about objects. It's about uh, object references. But this library doesn't have any way of communicating a Java object reference to Erlang. So you can commute basic data types like integers, longs, but not really Java object references. And you want to do that, of course, especially for testing. And the third uh, drawback is performance, but uh, we are not probably going to be able to address that much here. Okay. So there are other options. So one option is Aryang, which is really, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't know, which is really an interesting system where a person has gone uh, out and built a uh, Erlang virtual machine, if you will, on top of the Java virtual machine. So there is really a tight integration of the languages, and this is something to me, uh, to my opinion, pretty interesting. And according to the web page, so this is a quote from the web page, it does work. I have never tried it, but uh, maybe it's not completely ready for prime time yet. Seems to be the conclusion. So if you have other uh, input on that, tell me, and I will be curious. Anyway, we started this work before Aryang was uh, developed. But that's certainly an option. Okay, so having looked at that, what, what do we want to do? Well, our design goals is uh, we want to build this library, Java Erlang, on top of the interface because it has some good features, but we want to streamline the process of, of calling Java code from Erlang, right? Uh, for instance, we don't. Another thing we don't want to do. Somehow, sometimes when you see these libraries, you see there is a lot of work on pre-compilation of Java interfaces needed and all these things. Uh, we don't like to do that. So we want everything to be ready from the box in some sense. And a way to do that, uh, a technical comment, is to use Java Reflection, which actually works pretty well. So there is a mechanism in Java language that sort of you can use for getting a lot of information from from uh, Java classes and things like that programmatically. So Java Reflection is really nice. We use it a lot. Uh, so another design goal, we want to be able to communicate Java reference to from Erlang without any problems, of course. And as a fifth goal, uh, which is perhaps a little bit more unexpected because we're doing testing, but it's, it's somehow natural in the sense of the languages we're working with because both Java and Erlang are, of course, garbage collected languages, automatic garbage collection. So in some sense, it's sad if we start passing object references from uh, Java to Erlang. It is sad if we cannot any longer uh, garbage collect them. So we want to be able to enable safe and automatic garbage collection of Java objects whose references have been sent to Erlang. And there are two issues here. One issue is that, well, it could be, suppose we send an object reference from Java to Erlang. Well, maybe Java forgets about this object reference, and uh, it starts garbage collecting the underlying object. That wouldn't be good. So. 
we don't want Java to garbage collect too early. But it could also be that because of the fact that we have communicated this object reference to Erlang, it's the underlying object is never going to be garbage collected. So we have to have Erlang talk to the Java side and say, oh, now actually it's safe to garbage collect this object. And to do that automatically without any programming. Okay, so that's the task. So uh, let me, because this is a conference about programming and things like that, so let me illustrate a little bit of the API by actually using it here. Okay, instead of doing just a boring slide presentation. So we will run the code now. So this will run Erlang. We have to start a node because the Erlang uh, side is going to be a node that's going to talk to another Java node. Okay, so give it a name, let's say EUC for instance, and it starts. We are using an old version of Erlang. Apologies for that, it works on 17 as well, but never mind. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, you want to create a Java runtime to talk to the Erlang runtime. So how do you do that? Well, our library has a certain uh, number of modules, and the primary module is Java, and that has a method here, uh, which is called start node for creating a Java node. It doesn't take any parameters, but it, what it does, it's on the same machine, it's going to start a Java runtime, okay? And it will return, okay, a node if it is successful. It was, okay, we, now Java has started running on this machine, everything is fine, what can we do? Well, what is the first thing you do in Java? Probably, you create an object, right? Okay, let's create an object. So we have a, uh, a method or a function in Java called new, which as a first parameter accepts the node identifier, because this is about nodes, so th the same Erlang node can actually talk to several Java nodes. We're not limited to talking just one-to-one -one communication here, okay? And the second parameter is the class, of which we want to create an instance. So let's, for instance, create an integer. So we give the whole path. This is perhaps a little bit ugly, but it's no big deal, okay? And we want to send along a parameters to this, uh, this operation, so we're going to call the constructor for uh, the integers in Java, and there is one, for instance, that accepts an, integer, an int as a parameter. So we can create an object, integer object, we have a storing the value to. Okay, we did it, fine. Okay, come back pretty quickly. And uh, we can store it in a variable, we can create another object and store it in a variable. So I does, I2. It's actually another object, of course. We created a new object, so we had two, but the first one is no longer accessible. Okay, so it could possibly be garbage collected later on. Um, so <coughs> we can do more things. We can uh, call other constructors. We can, for instance, uh, there is a string constructor. We can pass along a string here and create an integer uh, storing the number 30, okay? We can make errors as well, of course. We can try to call this new, but adding, giving a float instead. And this crashes on the Java side. Well, it doesn't really crash. This doesn't crash on the Java side. It crashes on the Erlang side. But the, the, the consequences is the same. So we get back an exception. So if this crash had been on the Java side, we would have gone back, uh, gotten back a Java exception. But anyway, they are, these are catchable errors that one can handle, okay? So we can create objects. What else do you want to do? You want to create, you want to call methods of these objects. So we can do call and uh, we give an object reference or the representation Erlang of that object reference. So we can, for instance, for i2, we can, for instance, call the method uh, int value. This is a standard Java method in the integer class, of course. What does it return? Let me uh, get it up perhaps a little bit slightly as well. Never mind. So what does it do? It returns the int for the object, uh, for the integer that's stored inside there. Okay, so it doesn't take any parameters. It returns two. Okay, cool. What else do you want to do in Java? You want to uh, access the attributes. So for instance, for the integer class, there is an attribute um, max value, I think, which is the maximum uh, integer, positive integer that I can store in an integer object. Okay. So we have an operation get, but this attribute is not an attribute of the um, 
of any object, so it's an attribute of the class, so it's a static attribute, if you will. So there are, uh, there are, method, there are functions for calling, accessing uh, object attributes, but here we are calling a static one, so we call a different function get static. It needs the node because there is no object. Uh, it needs the class name. Yeah, I will, I will get it up a little bit, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, I'm not sure how to do that. So, and we have as a parameter the value. Okay. So, uh, we got an attribute, a class attribute. We accessed it. We, it returned a value uh, uh, from the integer class, and the attribute name was max value. So, you can see a lot of the things here are represented as Alang atoms, for instance, class names, method names, attribute names, those are Alang atoms. And you can, one can discuss whether this is a good choice or not, but it's the thing that is implemented right now, okay? And this was the value returned, okay? So, uh, a quick demo. Let's continue. But uh, I should say that this was uh, in no way prepared. We didn't have to compile those things, the example, in any way. We, ju we just started a Java runtime, and they started talking to each other, and easy. Okay, compared to J-interface, Things are very easy, actually. So this is another example you can take a look on later. Okay, so the API for the Java module, which is the the primary model uh, module, is the following, more or less. You have already seen it, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Um, fair to make a couple of comments. We try to make the job easier. So, for instance, we try to do things like um, out of boxing, so converting ints to integers, or things like that. We try to make sure that um, the values that you can send along to method calls, to uh, uh, um, constructors, and things like that. So val here, this could, could either be the representation of an al in Erlang of an object reference in Java, or it can be a basic Erlang value that can be, in be interpreted in some meaningful way as a Java value. So for instance, the integers, the booleans, the atom null, those are things that you can send along as parameters, okay? So, implementation gets. how do we do it? Because this could be a little bit interesting for other people that want to do the same thing later on in other languages or for, for Erlang as well. So, how do we implement the, the new f uh, function that creates a new object instance? Given a node, given a class name, an atom, and giving us a list of arguments, okay? So let's do it step by step. Um, so the first thing we do on the Erlang side, on the Erlang node, because that's the caller always, Erlang is the caller, and Java is the recipient. Okay, so the first thing one does is to look at the class, and there is a table on the Erlang side that stores all the classes. So there is some information that there that we need. So if the class is not previously known, uh, uh, we have to do some stuff, otherwise we can continue a little bit later on. But let's assume that the class is not previously known, then we ha the Erlang side sends a request to the Java side saying, please give me the class information for that class, and the Java side, uh, using reflection, digs up the information about that class, and uh, wh what does it get back? Well, it gets back essentially the names of all methods, their types and things like that, the subclasses, the attributes, for that class, the public members of that class, if you will. And what it gets back is not just text strings or something like that, but it's actually objects, object references, that represent ways to, to call these uh, methods and constructors and what you will, okay? And so that's an infrastructure that we send along to, to Erlang then, as the next step. So we basically just uh, do some uh, mapping of uh, of Java object references to an Erlang representation and a little bit more stuff, and we send it along to ja the Erlang side. So, okay, so now we have the class info that we need. Okay, so we can, uh, the Erlang side can now hopefully take a decision by itself. It can look at the, the class infrastructure, it can look at the arguments, and can see, okay, which constructor do I have to call? So, and it will find a concrete constructor, hopefully, otherwise there is an error, an exception, so it will find a concrete constructor uh, C here, and this is the representation in Erlang of a real Java object reference. Okay, so what do we do? We just 
send a request to the Java side saying basically, although uh, basically call this constructor with this set of arguments, okay? And Java gets these requests. It has to map from the Erlang. It has to translate Erlang object references to Java object references. So the constructor here, uh, digging that out, the real object here, the real object references, and the same for the arguments, okay? And then it can just invoke the constructor on the objects using Java reflection. Okay, fine. And later on, it sends along to Erlang the return value of that, um, of that call. Okay, again, taking care to mapping from Java to Erlang. Okay. So things are fairly straightforward. We use reflection a lot. Uh, we use mapping of object references. Okay, so the object references, how do we translate? How do we represent a Java object references in Erlang? Okay, so this is really a tuple on the Erlang side. So we have uh, with four components, when it sends from uh, Java at least, so there are four components. There is a uh, unique uh, integer that identifies the identity of object, and that's unique at least on the node that the object, where the object resides, because every object resides on a, its own node, its own Java runtime, okay? And the same, we have a uh, class ID, so this is some kind of identifier that identifies in an efficient manner which class the object belongs to, okay? The immediate class. And there is also, for garbage collection purposes, there is an object reference counter, which counts essentially the number of times we have passed the same object reference to, to our lang side, and we need that to do garbage collection, okay? So on the Java side, essentially we have a big table, so that every Java object reference that gets sent to Erlang gets noted in this table, and uh, uh, a mapping between the object reference and a tuple like this, okay? And we do that for two purposes. One purpose is uh, to be able to consistently transform, uh, translate, of course, object references to and from Erlang representation, but also for garbage collection, we need to keep this object reference in the table until Erlang side says, oh, I'm done with you, okay? So this is to protect that Java doesn't premature garbage collect uh, object references, okay? So, uh, garbage collection. So how is that done? And this is the, one of the interesting things that it has become possible to do this lately in Erlang. I think five years ago, I think it wasn't really possible to do something like that. And it's the introduction of the Erlang uh, foreign function interface, the, the NIFS that has made this possible, okay? So when an object, the representation in Erlang on an object reference comes into the, on from Java to the Erlang side, well, it comes in like an object like that. We saw a tuple with four components, four elements. Well, it gets translated immediately by the Erlang layer into something slightly different the object reference counter is replaced by what we can call, or what is called in standard terminology, an uh, NIF. So this is a spelling error, a NIF resource object. And this is basically just a blob of something that we're not going to inspect ever, but this blob has the nice characteristics that when this blob is no longer, it's no longer possible to reference this blob from any part of the Erlang runtime system, well, then there is an associated delete constructor in the uh, NIF library that's going to go get called saying, oh, nobody refers to this blob anymore, this research object. So this function can then say, oh, actually I have a table here mapping this blob to, to an uh, object reference counter and an object ID. So it's probably a good idea for me at this point in time to inform Java that uh, this object reference count, this object reference is no longer uh, used, or we have one, one instance of using that is no longer valid, so you can decrease your reference counter that's in Java, and the Java sites receives these messages, and if the counter goes to zero, it can sort, uh, just remove the entry from the, um, the table, the big table that exists on the Java side. Okay, so this is using NIFs to a nice, in a nice way, and I really like that they exist. Uh, but one of the drawbacks, perhaps, is that if you're working on an Erlang platform that does not support NIFs, well, you don't get garbage collection. Things will work still, but you will never be able to garbage collect things sent to Erlang. Okay? So, 
A couple of other points about the library. So both Erlang and Java has threads, or Erlang has processes, Java has threads. So one needs actually to take some stand how, how if a process makes a request, um, wants to call a Java object or something like that, how is that represented on the Java side? Uh, and the decision we have taken is, by default at least, every Erlang process talks to its own Java thread. And this seems to be pretty natural. We are sort of liberated from things like, well, if there, we call a Java method, it takes a long time from one process, this is not going to block the whole library forever because of that. So we can make lots of simultaneous calls, ideally. Um, the, there is another issue as well. So some Java libraries, for instance, the Swing GUI library, actually requires you, as a caller, to always call its methods from the same thread, Java thread. So this gives a nice way. If we want to use the Swing GUI library from Erlang, then we have a way of doing that as well in a controlled manner. So we can let one process always be responsible for calling the Swing GUI methods. And that, that sort of is pretty OK. So we have done a lot of stuff. But um, is there anything missing? Do you miss anything from this functionality? What are we missing? We can create objects, we can create, we can call the methods of the objects, we can call attributes. Do we need anything more from Java? To do anything more with Java? Starting threads, we can do that. We, 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 this slide, more or less. What, what else do we need? What else do you need, do you do when you program in Java? You create classes, right? We need to create classes. So this, there has been nothing about creating classes so far. And we don't want to write Java code. So we don't want to create classes in Java either. But there are actually libraries which require you create ni new classes. So let's look at an example. So here, for instance, if we want to use this Swing GUI library, for instance, uh, we can easily do that. Here, this is code for creating a button in Swing. So we say Java colon, uh, colon new. Uh, this is the button uh, class, J button, and we can give it a label. So the label on the button will be hello initially. Okay, fine. Now we can oh, we can add it to the um, we can add it uh, to the some window, etc., and things like that. Okay, pretty straightforward. But suppose when a user presses the button, suppose that we want to change the label from hello to world. So this is some action. The standard way of doing that in the GUI library, the Swing library, is uh, we have to provide something called an action listening listener object. So we have to call a method of the button, which is called set action, which accepts as a parameter the object that is going to listen to events that happen to that button. Okay? So we want to have an action listener object that looks and see if the if it the thing that labeled my, uh, the button was hello, we, we want to change it to world, and vice versa. But we really don't have any Java class that does this, of course. No? And, uh, well, what, what is available? Well, there is, for instance, in practice, what people do, they look at the abstract action class, Java class, which is an abstract class, it cannot really be instantiated, and they from that class, they usually derive a new class which does what exactly what you're supposed to do, changing hello to world. Okay? So what we have gone out and do done in, uh, in this library is to implement a facility for defining classes in Erlang, pure Erlang, no? Java classes. And it's almost doable. There is a, in Java Reflection, in standard Java, there is something called proxy classes, and they're almost usable for this purpose. Except there is a problem with the abstract classes. One cannot really uh, create uh, a new class that uh, in her, uh, uh, from from an abstract action. Okay. So we were forced to use one of these bytecode manipulation packages, and concretely this byte assist uh, Java assist bytecode manipulation package. So that's integrated inside the uh, Java Erlang library. So let's look at how does it look like in practice. Our task. Okay. So we have a new module, Java Proxy, for creating these classes, the new classes, proxy classes. It has a function class, which accepts as its first parameter the node that we want, where we want to create a new class. Uh, then we have the name of the class. We're going to call it actListen, in this case, our class that we create. And the immediate superclass, 
is going to be the abstract action, the abstract uh, class. So from that class, we are going to inherit some methods, for instance, to string for uh, converting a Java object to a string representation. So those kind of things we get from abstract action. Okay? And here is where we define the, uh, the new functionality, if we will. So we are going to uh, define a new function, action performed, um, with the following Java type. So it has to accept an action event. And here is the Alang implementation by a function called action performed with three parameters. So this is the implementation. So this is the recipe for, for creating a class. We also have to provide a definition of this, this uh, function, of course, on the next slide. Okay. So this is how you do it. It gets three parameters. The first one is some kind of context, which, which proxy object was, was uh, called and things like that. We don't care about it here. The second one is a state parameter. So because Java is stateful, probably our Java Erlang classes that represent Java classes are going to have to be stateful as well. So we have a state here that can be changed by the functions, a little bit like a gen server or something like that. And the third parameter is the, uh, the one that we specified here as the really the, the type of the function or the method. So it's an action event here. Okay, so that's the event. So let's code the, the functionality down. The first thing we do, we look at the source where uh, for that event there is a method called getSource for finding where, where did the event originate. So hopefully this is the button, otherwise we're in bad trouble. Uh, we can dig out the text that uh, was uh, printed on the button, string to list, Java call, button get text, etc. And we can analyze that text, say if the text was hello, we change it to world and vice versa. And finally, we call set text again on the button with a new string, the new value. And then, uh, so there are two things we can do at the final. We have to return a value, so the method has to return something. In this case, we don't really want to return anything, so we uh, specify the void uh, value, which is um, basically saying it's not going to return anything. We could also specify a, uh, an updated state, but we don't care about that for in this function either, so we just forget that parameter. Okay? But, so, okay, we have created a Java class in the library, and that's pretty nice. Um, there are a couple of limitations. There's one limitation right now. We are dealing with a situation where actually these member functions should probably not call uh, other proxy objects in a recursive manner. So we are, one wants to avoid recursion, at least with the current implementation of things. Maybe that will change later. But it's not really clear what the semantics of such a recursion is either. Okay? So, performance. So one of the drawbacks of using J-interface is about uh, lack of performance that people have been pointing out. So at least we want to take a look at that here and see what kind of performance you can expect to get out of the library. So probably the most important parameter is how long does it, if you make a call to a method, how long does it take to get a reply? So for a simple method, that doesn't do so much, okay? So here is some statistics for the, uh, for calling the int value method of an integer that you saw before. So it, for an integer, it just returns the int that is somehow uh, associated with this integer. Okay? So just making this call and noting the reply. How long does it take? Well, it's a little bit interesting, actually, because one could think that this, the, it should be sort of very, um, perhaps the, the uh, minimum time should be pretty static, but it turns out that if you sort of embed lots of these calls next to each other, uh, then you will get drastically better performance. So here's an experiment where suppose you call it only once or one time, well, it will take around 800 uh, microseconds, almost a millisecond. Whereas if you do a lot of them consecutively, you will be down under 200 um, uh, microseconds. So this is a little bit surprising to me. I'm not completely sure how to interpret whether this is due to um, artifacts on the Java runtime system, could be, or whether it's due to artifacts on the J-interface side, but it's at least a little bit curious. One can see that, well, it's not a great performing library, it's not totally horrible either, and if you have ideas uh, on how to optimize the interface, please approach me as well, I'm, I'm really curious, okay? So, summary, let's summarize, because we want to have coffee soon. So, 
Java Erlang provides, a, in my opinion, a really easy to use, a really nice interface for calling Java code from Erlang. You don't have to write any Java code, basically, at all. Okay? It handles almost all Java. There are a couple of exceptions. One exception is for doing, uh, if you want to write code in, in Erlang that uh, synchronizes on monitors and things like that, well, this is a little bit difficult, tricky to do, because the API for doing those kind of synchronizations are not in the, um, in the Java API itself, but they are done on the Java virtual machine layer. So one could support this in the library as well, but this would mean having to um, probably uh, talk to the uh, Java native interface, which is a foreign function interface for Java. Okay, one, one could do that, but we haven't been interested enough to do it yet. There's little maintenance required. I mean, you can get new Java versions, you can get new Erlang version, but typically everything works out of the box. So, and this is good because we don't really have time to fix so many bugs. So we can, typically we can just keep on work using this library, okay? Another interesting point in my opinion, one of the most interesting one, is that we have accomplished uh, automatic cross-language garbage collection, which is something you don't see in many libraries, many foreign function li libraries. There are some concerns as well. Uh, we still have speed concerns. This is not the library to use if you want to have really high performance calling from, from Erlang to Java. Uh, we can probably imp improve the implementation of Java classes in Erlang as a little bit. And uh, as you can see, I'm really bad at syntax. So one could probably embed this in a nice macro-ish style to make sure that Java language because Java looks really nice, you don't have to send along this list of parameters and things like that, but so far I really don't care because it, things are okay enough in my opinion, okay? So about the future, finally about the future, what, what do we want to do in the future? Well, one of the things that embarrass me a little bit when giving talks like this, because people are concerned about database interfaces, whatever, lots of transactions per second, so I start wondering, mm, Maybe this is too slow to be useful. So one of the things that we could do, for instance, is try to use the Java native interface to sort of throw away J interface. Okay, we don't care about J interface. Let's implement the J interface part ourselves. And let's do it on the, uh, on the as a C library, if you will. So we can use the Java native interface, that's a C interface to Java, and we can couple that with the Erlang uh, NIF um, foreign function interface, and we could probably replicate to a big, big extent what J interface does, and we can probably in that way get a lot of better in performance out. And this is something that maybe, maybe we could do. Uh, we would still be a little bit slower than the uh, doing native callings of Java for a couple of reasons. One thing is that we're using uh, Java Reflection a lot, and that has a performance penalty. So if you use Java Reflection, that's going to be slower than, than uh, writing your Java program and compiling it, okay? So there's a cost. Another cost is we're doing table lookups to translate uh, Java object references to their representation in Erlang, and that has a cost as well. Maybe Erlang NIFs will have a cost as well. So we are not going to be uh, as quick as uh, writing your programs in Java directly, but we, we could be substantially better, I think. Okay, so thank you. We have five question. minutes for questions. Hi, thank you, Lars. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because I kind of missed the first couple of minutes, what yeah. actually triggered uh, you to take on this endeavor to produce uh, the Erlang Java library? So we have to do a lot of, um, so I'm teaching it uh, in Madrid, and we have got a lot of student exercises in Java, and we have to test them. And these are maybe, uh, this varies, so we can have maybe for a course, we could have 10 different Java uh, assignments. So we want to develop, we want to test this. We'd use QuickCheck for testing usually, so we want to uh, develop mod QuickCheck models for that. And we don't, I really don't like Java as a language. I want to write the testing code, test models in Erlang, and I want to have a really convenient way of calling Java. So it has to be convenient. So I don't want to write this J interface boilerplate code for everything I want to test. So I, zero, zero in some sense, boilerplate code is the idea here, okay? So testing, 
which where I don't need the kind of brutish performance that you need for some other tasks. So that's my goal in some sense, to do testing well. And I also want to call uh, Java libraries that uh, are good for uh, Selenium, whatever, things like that, JSON validation and things like that, where you have good libraries in Java, but you don't have the same quality libraries in Erlang. And I want to be able to use them. Okay. Uh, is it ready for production? That's always a question. Um, I use it a lot for testing, but um, there are a couple of things that would worry me a little bit for production. So um, the best thing is just to try. There, there is uh, some stupidity in how we look up the correct constructor, the correct method for applying. So we look at the both the arguments, and uh, we do some digging there, and we. This is this is maybe not buggy, but maybe it's not flexible enough. So we should look a little bit at that. But, but try it out. We use it. We have used it for testing now for three years or something like that. So it works for us. But we fix the bugs as well. So I don't know. Try it out. Are you? Yeah. Do you support subtyping and? Um Overloading based on subtypes and, th and those tricky things. I mean, they are supported. <laughs> they are supported because they are supported in Java side. So, uh, I mean, if you if you sort of create an object, if you have a if you define your own um, uh, if you define your own strings, whatever you have a string class and you create a string, uh, your string. And you get an your string reference on the Erlang side. You can of course pass this to uh, a method that would accept uh, normal strings in Java, because eventually Java ensures type, type safety on these kind of things. So it ensures, through reflection, it ensures that your arguments are actually valid. Okay. So the, the eventual check that everything is fine happens on the Java side. So it can happen when you try to apply something, you get back an exception. On the Java side, but you can expect you can expect those exceptions as well. So things are inspectable. So yeah, I they are supported. Maybe not directly in Erlang, but they are supported because Java supports them. One quick question. Yeah. If if that, is there anyone interested in the project, how can they participate? It's on GitHub. Send uh, take a look at the source code, make contributions, uh, make comments, try it out. So we have got a couple of. Mm, Contributions. One nice one we got uh, a couple of weeks ago was uh, Joe Norton, I think he's called, that uh, wanted to rebarify the uh, thing because we hadn't make file system before. And well, let's maybe it's a good idea to try rebar. So now it builds using rebar. So that was an example. Some contribution we got. We also got some contribution before from Vlad, Vlad who is doing the RLID and things like that. So th there are a couple of contributions, especially on the Java side, because I have to say I'm a lousy, lousy Java program. I'm not a good Erlang programmer, but I'm a worse Java programmer. So we need lots of help there. Do you think this project uh, at some point would bring, bring more Java people to Erlang community? No, because I think it's not, <laughs> no. I mean, no, because I think there are different worlds, right? Different concerns. So no, probably not. Maybe not a perfect marriage. Yeah. Okay. Luke. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, please give it up for Lars Orke. Thank you.